Hello everyone, before we get into today's episode, we would like to, as always, thank our patrons, including our executive producers, Mark Frost, Tony Chirin, and Eustace Abel for supporting the show. If you'd like to help support the show, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash histories most. And if you have any comments, suggestions, or any feedback, you can send it to histories.most at gmail.com. Thanks so much, and now on with the episode. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first episode of 2022 of History's Most. My name is Peter. And I'm Alex, and happy 2022, everybody. Thanks for joining <laughs> us. Um, we obviously have had a bit of a kind of um, hit and miss release schedule of late. We talked a little bit last episode that we, we obviously hadn't managed to get out too many episodes towards the end of last year. Um, huge variety of, of reasons for that. I think for a lot of people, 2021 was a, was a tough year, but mm-hmm. I mean, for me personally, it was very difficult, um, at times, but various reasons, not least, um, getting out my latest book, Hindenburg, Ludendorff and Hitler, Germany's generals and the rise of the Nazis. Yeah. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about kind of today isn't it peter that's right it's, it's an exciting time for you uh with the with the release of your book and i'm looking forward to talking about it today and what we're going to do today is we're going to kind of because we're we talked about weimar uh in the past so what we're but we we didn't cover all the things right so we're going to kind of yeah. cover some of the stuff that we didn't mention that is also covered in your book um such as uh, uh we're going to be talking a little bit about ludendorff um our favorite uh, one of our favorite historical figures right oh absolutely yes <laughs> um we're going to be talking about him we're going to be talking about um a bit more about hindenburg another of my favorites yeah. um and i'm really looking forward to um kind of doing this recording today talking to you peter talking to all the history's mosters out there for a couple of reasons um Number one is that I think these stories we're going to tell today um, are kind of intimately intertwined with this podcast. Um, Mm. Because if you go back to episode one, which if you've listened from the start, it was a very long time ago that you've got to listen to it. We thank you for for sticking with us. (laughs) (laughs) The world is such a different place. Um, (laughs) Um, Or indeed, you may, if you've listened through in order, you'll have listened to so many hours as I was talking that it will seem like three years ago. (laughs) Um, So when we actually started the podcast um, was kind of, I was in my early stages of research for this book. Um, Hence why the first topic we chose to talk about was Ludendorff, because I had all sorts of stuff about Ludendorff um, going around my head. it's interesting listening back because I've, you know, in the actual book, there's some things that I think, oh, I said then, which I now know were wrong or a simplification or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, of course, we had, I think it was something like episode 35 or something, we had Ludendorff Revisited. Um, yes, that's correct. The sequel that no one asked for. <laughs> um, when we had Jay Lockenauer, who's absolutely brilliant um, on kind of sharing his analysis of Ludendorff. Um, We did a a Weimar Journey series that was really well received. I remember um, Wesley, you know, Wesley from the Second World War podcast. He did the First World War podcast as well. He said some very kind things about it. And and Hindenburg was kind of front and central to that narrative, again, because I was in the midst of, at that point, writing um, this book. So it's kind of really this podcast and this book are totally kind of intertwined, um, which is quite nice. I feel like to go back to it now. Yeah, certainly. Um, I mean, we've been talking about kind of Weimar and Ludendorff, and we have talked about Hindenburg as well a little bit in our Weimar series. And so, yeah, you are right. It's very intertwined with, with the, the podcast in general. And so it's, it's it's good to see kind of all the themes that we've talked about kind of culminate in um 
you know this episode and your book um <laughs> so well yes so yeah i mean i'm very excited for that reason i'm very excited as well because it's our first recording of the year the second half or the kind of last six months of last year was very tough i had a lot of things on a day job this podcast which kind of fell by the wayside getting this book out and we also it sounds insane now to say it but we tried to do a day by day history series um all at the same time which we did do we did do hey to to we our credit <laughs> we did manage um, to do it but uh over on youtube that is of course the crisis um but probably when we launched that and we said it wouldn't affect the podcast, we were being a little bit naive. Yeah, right? we didn't we didn't quite think about the amount of effort that it takes that goes into making something like that, you know, because um, it, it is a, a good amount of effort. I mean, just between, uh, you know, your researching and my editing, it, uh, it, it a lot of sleepless nights for me. Big old project. Yeah. Wasn't it? Um, that we probably didn't quite appreciate, but we're going to keep the YouTube channel going, but not on such a slavish schedule yeah. as keeping up with, with dates of real events. Um, but kind of once, you know, bringing out videos when they're ready, <laughs> um, which, you know, who'd have thought talking of bringing things out when they're ready. Um, let's talk about um, Eric Ludendorff's writings because he, very much did rush out some writings after the First World War. Now, yeah, this is something that we mentioned in our first episode. It was later on, it was in the second half of that episode when we talked about it was after the war. And Ludendorff, he, what, wasn't he, he fled to Sweden, I want to say? And he completely isolated himself and just wrote, just wrote these memoirs. And they were, I mean, um, a little off the deep end, I guess you could say. Yes, um, and you're absolutely right, Peter. Well remembered from 2019. Um, perhaps we should circulate, circulate like a, like a quiz for our listeners to go along with this. Yeah. <laughs> what you remembered? <laughs> um, were you listening carefully? But anyway, you're absolutely right. He fled into exile in Sweden for a few months after the end of the First World War. He was certainly um, mentally fragile. Um, way back in episode 35, I think it was 35, when we talked to Jay Lockenauer, you know, we, he's kind of got some interesting views about, about mental health, and ultimately we can't say. But this is a quote from a letter he wrote to his wife at that time. He said, For four years I have fought for my country, and now when so much is hanging the balance, I must stand aside. I am at war with myself and the whole world. Dearest, it isn't easy to pull myself together again. My nerves are too much on edge, and sometimes my speech gets out of control. There is no help for it. My nerves have simply gone to pieces. Tell everybody how like my fate was, was to that of Hannibal. That will teach them to understand. Keep these letters, dearest. In time they will form my memoirs. Wow. Pretty intense. Well, yeah. I mean, um, it, it, it sounds like the writings of a man who has spent the past four years fighting pretty hard in a war that he's just lost. It does. And it sounds like a broken man, a man who yes. has kind of accepted that he is in a terrible state um, and that he's kind of helpless. Um, now, he didn't end up, I think, using those that letter for his memoirs um, because he, he'd finished his memoirs by February of 1919 and they were published the subsequent August. And Ludendorff, as we've said many times on this show was a workaholic, you know, he was um, kind of frighteningly focused on what was in front of him. And these memoirs were, um, I think over 200,000 words ran to, 628 pages wow um a massive kind of undertaking and although they were they were fairly expensive um and obviously extremely detailed to the point where some people you know would be a bit put off by a tome of that size it did sell um something 
perhaps approaching 100,000 copies. So not not a you know not an insignificant piece of work, even yeah. if later memoirs like say Hindenburg's would have would have sold better. Now we did an episode um, again. I think it's in the early 30s about um, the stab in the back myth. And this idea that Jews slash politicians slash communists, insert whoever you like, was actually responsible for Germany's defeat and the role we've talked about Hindenburg and Ludendorff, how important they were for spreading this myth. Mm. And what I want to chart with this kind of look, this retrospective, if you like, of Ludendorff's writings is the kind of um, slippery slope he descends um, from 1919 to the end of his life um, in 1937. Because mm, it is it is a very slippery slope indeed. If you if you've listened to episode 35 with uh, Jay Lockenauer, you uh, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed. Now the interesting thing is when he writes his memoirs in 1919, he's fairly um, either he's cautious in not perhaps expressing some of his more extreme views, or I think more likely those views haven't quite fully matured and developed. Mm. He still is um, proponing the stab in the back myth, um, promoting that, as as we've kind of said. And he says that, you know, Germany, lacking any firm hand, bereft of all will, robbed of her princes, collapsed like a house of cards. All authority disappeared. Chaos, Bolshevism, terror, un-German in name and nature made their entry into the German fatherland. Soldiers and workmen's councils, prepared in long, systematic, underground work, were now established. Men had occupied themselves with these matters who, if they'd served at the front, might have ensured victory. Now, obviously, this is you know, the stab in the back myth. This yeah. is the idea that it's a conspiracy. Um, and he hints at foreign aspects as well. Um, Bolshevism, this idea as a, as a foreign creed, has, has uh, come into the country that as well, that the revolution he, he's implying here was, was long planned mm. um, as, as a plot to undermine Germany. But what he does do is he kind of steers clear from outright kind of, for example, naming the Jews as, as a source of these conspiracies. Yeah, I was about to ask, you know, because obviously Hitler believed in a Judeo-Bolshevik conspiracy, um, and I was wondering how much of that came from Ludendorff. Well, in, in his memoirs in 1919, he, he would use more, I think what we would today describe as kind of dog whistle language. Right, he said that, right. Um, the people behind some of these plots were um, or, or working in the shadows, if you like, perhaps he hinted were Jews because he said, um, the government allowed the conduct of affairs to slip more and more from its grasp. And the worst of it was it abandoned them, not to the people as a whole, but to certain groups which, through their history, had always displayed critical and never constructive faculties. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is obviously a kind of um, oblique attack there on the Jews, a people who through all their history have been critical and not constructive, I, I think. Mm. Um, so he's, he's kind of leaning on innuendo um, rather than direct attacks. And also... There's kind of evidence at this time that he wasn't a full-blown anti-Semite because, um, for instance, he, um, on his return to Germany, he had um, dinner with a number of different people, um, supposedly an English um, general who who might have put some some kind of words into his mouth, but also um, a, Jew, a famous Jewish journalist called Theodore Wolf. Um, so he clearly, you know, wasn't yet in his kind of final form, if you see what I mean. Right. Um, but he did still have this idea of the stab in the back myth. And he was absolutely saying that 
it wasn't his fault. And actually, one of the messages of his memoirs is, if people had listened to me, this would never have happened. Mm. However, obviously that changes and that viewpoint evolves. After um, the failed Cat Putsch in 1920, which we've talked about, um, he moves to Bavaria. And it's here that um, his views become more radicalized. He was already probably on the nationalist right. Some might even say far right. But in Bavaria, one of the things um, he says is that he is... Um, basically, I'm going to conduct research into the Jewish question. Mm. Um, he writes in a, a letter that I see the work of the Bolsheviks in the writing of the Jews. Okay. So your question there about the kind of Judeo-Bolshevik conspiracy. Yeah, in the early 20s, maybe not in 1919, but in the early 20s, certainly. So this is kind of where it's beginning to to kind of, I guess, take hold. And, and obviously that's going to kind of blossom into something uh, much more sinister as time goes on. Absolutely, yeah. And, and for example, in 1922, the German foreign minister, uh, Walter Rathenau, was assassinated. He was Jewish and Ludendorff kind of condemned him in, in one of his writings yeah. as a, an agent of, of um, Bolshevism when you know, he wasn't even left wing, but he was a Jew, therefore that association was clearly formed. And at this time, um, in 1921 to be precise, um, Ludendorff wrote his um, book, Military Leadership and Politics. And as the title suggests, he goes a bit further than just merely a memoir of the Great War, although he does spend a lot of time analysing the Great War, um, predictably. But he, he moves away from pure memoir, if you like, towards more ideological writing and also into more kind of advice for the future. If and kind of the, te- the title suggests that in a way, mm-hmm. um, how Germany's military and politics should be shaped going forwards. Now, interestingly, in this book, we can forget about those hints at different subversive elements and, and peoples. Um, he has gone full-blown anti-Semitism by this point. Okay, so this is just um, outright. Yeah. Um, and this is what I mean about the kind of slippery slope and his views developing or coming out into the open. Um, he describes how, you know, the, the in 1919, his big bogeyman had been Germany's politicians, the, the Kaiser's kind of chancellor and advisors and cabinet. Now he kind of blames the Jews for the mistakes of the Kaiser's government. He says that Germany's politicians put themselves mainly under Jewish influences, which were completely alien to the people and were in strict contrast to the German nature. The Jewish people wanted to rule over the people who had admitted them, as in let them into the country, to castrate us as men and people so that others with a stronger national will can rule us. Hmm. So it's outright conspiratorial yeah. anti-Semitism. And finally, you know, Ludendorff, I think this was a key for his mental process. He had found the link that bound together all the people he was frustrated at, whether it be the politicians, whether it be the revolutionaries, whether it be pacifists, whether it be um, war profiteers. The workings of the Jew must be behind all of it. Yeah, so it's that... It it allows him to tie together, you know. It's 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 like every conspiracy theory, really. I mean, it's it's the question of you know who is behind it, and the easy answer for a lot of people is the anti-Semitic. You know, well, this is this is where a lot of this stuff gets formed, isn't it? Where a lot of conspiracy theories, even that we see today, this is kind of part of the root of it, isn't it? Absolutely, and and. I think, again, if you want to think about the impact of this, one of the phrases that Lundorf, or one of those um, pieces of advice I said that he puts for the future of, of how Germany should be changed, he says that in the coming war, because he's sure there will be another one, yeah, Germany's going to have to be free of Jews. The phrase Judenwein 
which is a phrase and a policy position that the Nazis obviously adopt. Um, and indeed, Hitler actually said that um, in the early 20s, he said that this book, Military Leadership and Politics, was um, you know, really influential or that he admired it or he learned a lot from it. Hmm. The, one of the other interesting things he does in this book is Ludendorff um, takes aim at um, Clausewitz, you know, the um, famous military kind of theorist and philosopher whose um, kind of most well-known phrase was war is politics by other means. And Ludendorff flips it on its head and he his interpretation is more or less that um, instead of war being an extension of politics, politics is actually going to have to serve the purposes of war and that um, someone, preferably I think him, would have to seize dictatorial power and organise the country in a way that would kind of mean that it's on a permanent war footing. And that's the kind of only way for the nation to survive in the future, for right. it to be in a constant state of military readiness and for, like I say, politics to serve the needs of war. Well, as we leak. <laughs> yeah, well, as we discussed um, in, in some of those earlier episodes, Ludendorff, um, yeah, he he had a whole school of thought about how, you know, it, it really was this incredible militarism isn't it you know where it's it's he thinks that the only way for a, a state to survive is just being in a in a constant state of of either war or military preparedness and he had some you know i think we discussed we had some he had some crazy ideas about uh about that war that never-ending war right what what yeah. was some of, what was the thing some of the things that he suggested like in terms of strategy something about I don't remember as occupying Eastern Europe or something like that. Well, he had in the First World War advocated a, a very large empire that Germany would establish in Eastern Europe with the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. And in terms of his practical plans for the future, well, that actually brings us on nicely um, to kind of his final significant work, um, which in English is called Total War. Oh, okay. Um, and this is written much later. This is written in 1935, after Germany has publicly announced rearmament, reintroduced conscription, which, you know, for Ludendorff at least, and you know, for a lot of the world as well, is a signal that there will be, a, you know, a war on the horizon. Yeah. And that Germany is determined to kind of restake its claim as, as a global power. Now, it, we kind of have to fill in the blank here a little bit between 1921, when he writes military leadership and politics, and 1935, when he writes Total War, because in that intervening four years, he's basically aligned himself with the Nazi party, led the Beer Hall Putsch, escaped imprisonment, uh, attempted to stake a, a control over the Nazi party, failed to be elected president on a Nazi ticket, broken with the Nazi party and descended into a much more isolated and, and in many ways more mystical world of conspiracy theory with his wife and their own following known as the Tannenberg League. Mm. Um, this includes his kind of conversion to her religious faith, which is the kind of German understanding of God, which is separate from Christianity and is supposed to tie back to much more um, ancient Germanic roots. Yep. Um, his writings in, in the in-between time in the late 20s and early 30s, which were quite prolific, were um, considerably less comprehensible than the things we've been talking about. Um, for instance, he wrote a book or a pamphlet, I, I believe, I can't remember which, called The People's War on German Soil. Which was a which was a like a um, like a forecast that in the year 1932, because the numbers 1932 apparently had some sort of 
significance that there would be a world war fought between three powers, France, Italy, and the Soviet Union, um, and that Germany was the soil over which they would fight. Um, and each of them was a kind of pawn of a different conspiratorial um, global power. Well, that uh, didn't really happen. No, um, that prediction proved to be untrue. Um, he also wrote... Um, Hitler's betrayal of the German people to the Roman Pope. Yeah, uh, yeah, this is getting into weird of, territory now. Once he'd broken with the Nazis, his, his main criticism of them that was that they were they were mere agents of the Catholic Church, um, and that that was another kind of supranational conspiracy. Um, but let's go to his book, Total War, in 1935, which is a really interesting one. When we talk to Jay Lockenauer, one of his views is that this was actually a really significant work, um, that it was read at the high levels of the German military, um, that the chief of the German general staff, um, Beck, uh, I think Ludwig Beck, um, basically was an was a adherent to, to Ludendorff's ideas, read the book, was a, was a fan of him. Um, on the other hand, the kind of view, I think, for many years has actually been that this was um, a rather outdated book. It still was stuck in the kind of First World War world that Ludendorff was still trying to understand and explain. Roger Chickering maybe posts, posits a kind of in-between view in that he says it's it sounded unoriginal in 1935, but that was largely because the Nazi party and indeed the German military had kind of already adopted a lot of his views, at least when it comes to his analysis of the First World War. Um, so what does he actually write? Well, he returns to that issue of what happened in the First World War and who, who was to blame. Um, and he's kind of, this is the most extreme version of the stab in the bat myth. He kind of says, in Germany, the Jews and the Roman church with their accomplices, perhaps communists, I'm not sure. I, um, I guess. Availed themselves of the social and economic abuses to destroy the unity of the people. In their lust for power, Judah and Rome, controlling the world finances, had, by a purely capitalistic organization of the economic life on the one hand, and by socialist, communist, and collectivist doctrines on the other, introduced these abuses among the nations of Europe, and thus also among the German nation. Um, he even goes as far as to criticise German nationalists for using the word fatherland, mm. um, because he says that um, Jehovah promised the whole world as the fatherland of the Jews. Um, he describes... Christianity as an alien creed that was the prime cause of breakdown in total war, presumably past and present total wars. And he makes his case for his kind of Germanic religion, yeah. which he kind of argues the populace won't fight on unless their morale is maintained by a kind of collective spirituality. Um, and interestingly, um, I've seen people say that he was kind of advocating um, his religion as a kind of ja equivalent to the contemporary Japanese culture, um, you know, the kind of Shinto yeah. beliefs around sacrifice and duty, um, and that he wanted to, they had an underlying kind of militaristic. That, um, the Bushido kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Militarism. Kind of spirit uh, that he wanted a, a kind of Germanic version of that. Um, as, you know, That's an obviously. interesting, interesting way of looking at it. And uh, the other aspect of it, this kind of spiritual side and the, the retrospective of the First World War again. But the other side is is um, what he thinks a future total war would look like and how it could be won. And his, his vision is for the supreme warlord, a total um, military, a military figure with total dictatorial power. 
over all aspects of life, all aspects of policy, no politicians to interfere. And he's clearly thinking about himself here, despite his um, you know, standing in politics by yeah. that time being virtually non-existent. And how old is he at this point in time? Um, I think he's he dies in 37, uh, so I think he's 70 by this point. Okay. Um, and he, he was clearly thinking of himself because he talked about how the this supreme warlord, this commander-in-chief, um, is going to have to be a lonely figure, is going to have to be a kind of detached figure who, you know, is, is on his own shoulders bearing the burden of fighting a total war. Right, and that's obviously how he views himself. Indeed, yeah. Um, and I think it's also a little bit interesting because, of course, in the conduct of the First World War, he had done everything hand in hand with Hindenburg. Mm. Um, it had been very much a duo. It had been what Hindenburg described as a happy marriage. So I do think it's quite interesting that he talks so much about how one individual will have to shoulder all of it and how it will have to be a lonely post. Well, what it, What is Ludendorff and Hindenburg's later relationship well they really fell out in the second half of the 1920s um hindenburg used to visit ludendorff every year in bavaria because he used to um hindenburg's uh, went on a holiday to bavaria a hunting holiday every year and so when he was down in the region he would pay a visit with um, often quite a lot of fanfare to see ludendorff but um, once he became president, and Ludendorff by this point is very much associated with the Nazi party, um, it was clearly felt that Hindenburg as president should not visit um, Ludendorff. Right. You know, it would look bad. It would be divisive. It would um, perhaps even alienate foreign governments. So he basically sent a letter, I think this would be 1925, the summer after Hindenburg became president, um, saying, I'm very sorry, can't come this year at quite short notice. And Ludendorff took it very, very badly. Yeah. Um, and the final break came in the opening of the Tannenberg Memorial, um, the memorial to their famous battle, um, which was opened in 1927. And Ludendorff publicly slighted Hindenburg. He refused to stand next to him. He refused to go to a dinner that, that was given um, for the both of them. And from then on, you know, they, they, I don't believe they, they ever spoke again. Hmm. Well, I guess that it does explain why Ludendorff is kind of divorcing himself in this in this <laughs> metaphorical sense of, uh, you know, only one person should shoulder the... Uh, the brunt, the burden of the, uh, of this, this, this whole thing. Indeed. And the, the, you know, the happy marriage ended in a messy divorce. Yeah. Yeah. Talking of which, I think that that's a nice kind of segue for us to talk about Hindenburg. Okay. Um, so obviously Hindenburg needs no introduction for listeners of history's most, the, front man of Germany's First World War war effort, the hero of that war, the president from 1925 to 34. Today, um, I wanted to talk about Hindenburg after Hitler was appointed chancellor, because we stopped, our Weimar series ended with the moment of Hitler becoming Chancellor of Germany on the 30th of January, 1933. Okay. So this is something we haven't um, talked about for before. Um, and it's something that the image, I think, is often quite mistaken that Hindenburg was um, either kind of senile and didn't know what was going on, um, during Hitler's first kind of year and a half in power, or that somehow Hindenburg was remained a kind of constant threat to Hitler's power, constantly working against him and, and, and somehow holding him back. But for these kind of last, uh, the last kind of year and a half of his life, I would rather, I think, describe Hindenburg as like a, 
a willing collaborator with the Nazi regime. Right. Um, and that's because for the most part, he was very actually pleased with the work of Hitler's government. He kind of behaved once he'd appointed Hitler chancellor um, with real kind of like satisfaction that he had achieved his goal of bringing stability to Germany, reuniting um, a divided kind of political spectrum that the Hitler government had succeeded in achieving the aims that Hindenburg had for his presidency in kind of ending the chaos and the division of Weimar. Mm. Is it a kind of thing of, well, I wasn't able to get this done, but maybe you will, and I'm satisfied with that, do you think? I think it was more that, you know, I don't think he really felt like he had handed over the baton necessarily because he was still the president. Mm. Um, you know, he was, as president, supposed to be constitutionally quite hands off. Right. And for the final two years or so of Weimar's history, he hadn't been through necessity, really, rather than any desire on his part. Because Hindenburg's management style, his leadership style, was always hands-off, delegatory. You know, his relationship with Ludendorff had always been basically let Ludendorff do what Ludendorff does best. And I'll kind of be the front man. I'll present our policy. I'll um, do the PR, if you see what I mean. Yeah, as the most popular man in Germany at the time. Exactly, yeah. Um, so... When Hitler became chancellor, one of the first kind of real moves towards um, a dictatorship was the Reichstag fire decree, which de facto banned the Communist Party, also suspended civil rights such as they were, um, and led to a wave of kind of Nazi terror. And Hindenburg had no objections to signing this decree, um, and he never raised any objections to its use. Mm. It was a presidential decree passed, you know, using his emergency powers. The only actually um, moment in in the first few weeks of the Hitler regime that that Hindenburg raised any kind of issue at all was that. Um, Hitler had given a speech in which he had been critical of Hindenburg's predecessor as president, Friedrich Ebert. Right. And Hindenburg uh, basically said, you know, gave him a little ticking off and saying, you know, Ebert was basically a decent man um, and, you know, we should respect him. But but that was that was kind of it. And for some reason, people seem to think that he was deluded or, or, or senile or, or whatever. But there's no actual evidence for that. There was plenty of jokes about that and that sort of thing. Um, but that had been made about Hindenburg. Those sorts of comments had been made about Hindenburg literally for years. Yeah. You know, dating back to the 1925 presidential election, people had said, oh, he doesn't really know what he's doing. People are just using him. Yeah, I mean, one of the propaganda lines that, um, I don't know which political party it was, but they said for the sake of Germany and for Hindenburg, don't vote, you know, don't vote for um Exactly, and for him. Spot on. Um, they kind of said, oh, leave him in peace. Yeah. Let him, let him retire. Um, but no, this is not the case. This was obviously, a, it was an image that Hindenburg had, had so successfully crafted over the years. He was kind of all people to all men that meant that no one could really believe, well, people who were maybe pro-democracy couldn't believe that Hindenburg would do such a thing as appoint Hitler chancellor. Right. When, in fact, he, he did, and he, he didn't um, do so under any kind of false pretenses. Um, and often people kind of say, well, look, it took, him, took them so long to persuade him to make Hitler chancellor. But that kind of shows the opposite. That doesn't show that he was weak and powerless and, and just confused. That kind of shows that he did weigh up this decision carefully, and it did take him a number of months to warm up to the idea of a Hitler chancellorship, Yeah, which kind of shows the opposite effect. Um, now, there was an election, another election in March 1933, which sometimes is, sometimes isn't counted as an election of the Weimar Republic because it was conducted under 
kind of semi-free. It was a semi-free election, if you see what I mean, in that Germany's other parties did run, but they were each under a varying degree of persecution right. and kind of terror. And the Nazi campaign, it was the Nazis' best ever election result um, with, I think, 44% of the vote. But they had Hindenburg's image on their posters. Um, they had co-opted Hindenburg for this campaign. And they kind of, their, their slogans and their message was, Hindenburg has put his faith in Hitler, so should you. You know, um, stand by mm-hmm. this kind of duo of Hindenburg and Hitler and vote Nazi. Right. And the Nazis followed up this election with a massive ceremony, um, which was known as the Day of Potsdam. And it was one of the first kind of Goebbels masterpieces. In Potsdam, um, in the garrison church, there is the tombs of what well, was at that time the tombs of various German Kaisers. Um, and it's kind of like a spiritual home of Prussian um, tradition. And the Nazis organized a huge event where um, both Hitler and Hindenburg would attend the church through huge kind of parades and, and, and crowds. And both men would kind of deliver a speech. Uh, Hitler's speech was kind of massively... Um, praising and and flattering Hindenburg and in a final kind of um, final kind of set piece um, Hindenburg shook Hitler's hand as Hitler bowed to him there's a kind of famous photograph but it was the point of this propaganda event was about Hindenburg's huge prestige huge reputation being conferred onto Hitler. Mm. It's almost like a kind of crowning ceremony. Um, It reminds me to some extent of the way in which um, in medieval times, the Holy Roman Empire, sorry, Holy Roman Emperor was crowned by the Pope. The thinking being obviously that the Pope as the representative of God on earth has the ability to make an emperor, you know, confer his legitimacy onto an emperor. And I feel like there was something very similar going on here. This is a quote from somebody, um, I think they were a journalist, they were by no means sympathetic to, to Hitler. Um, but this is, this is an impression of the event from an eyewitness. A sea of flags in the street, all cleverly done, impressive, spellbinding even, at any rate for the masses. We must not shut our eyes in the face of what is going on. Today and here, the marriage took place between the masses led by Hitler and the spirit of Potsdam, the Prussian values represented by Hindenburg. How marvellously it has been staged by that master producer Goebbels. The procession of Hindenburg and the government goes from Berlin to Potsdam past a line of cheering millions. The whole of Berlin seems to be on the streets. The radio announcer almost weeps with emotion. Hitler speaks. A true statesman appears to be developing. Not a word of hatred, not a word of racial ideology, no threat aimed at home and abroad. Hindenburg lays wreaths on the graves of Prussian kings and shakes hands with Hitler, who bows deeply. Cannons thunder over Potsdam, over Germany. No one can escape the motion, the emotion of the moment. Mother has tears in her eyes. Wow. And I think that very effectively gets across the impact of this. Yeah. And it is, I think, a good description, a marriage between the kind of old right represented by Hindenburg and the new right represented by Hitler. Yeah. Just a few days after that event in March 1933, the government passed the Enabling Act, which is a very famous piece of legislation. It basically creates the Nazi dictatorship because the Enabling Act um, gives Hitler the power to pass decrees, um, the same decrees that Hindenburg had been using as president to promulgate laws. So it means he no longer needs the Reichstag to govern Mm. and he no longer needs Hindenburg to govern. 
one of the big ideas of people like Papen had been they could control Hitler, you know, he would still be controllable because Hindenburg would hold the ultimate power. Yeah. But here's Hitler taking that power off him. So you might kind of think, well, what, what's Hindenburg doing here? Why would he accept this? Surely he'd be worried about the loss of his monopoly over executive power. <laughs> the opposite is the case. Hindenburg was delighted about the Enabling Act because in his own words, it's, he said that he would no longer be a signature machine. <laughs> right. His main concern in March 1933 was, well, I won't have to sign as many documents now. Hitler will be able to just do everything, take responsibility for the laws he's enacting. I won't have to, I won't have to do anything. Which is, you know, <laughs> I, I, remarkable. I mean, it, it's, what's the right word? Cynical, perhaps? I mean, it's, yeah. it's it a just, concern, does it uh, no, no, no concern. I just, I'm tired. And uh, here, just take, just and take this. Would, yeah, I mean, he was 85, he was yeah. tired. He was definitely, um, in early 33, he was definitely physically frail, yeah. no doubt about it. And he was tired and frustrated and and, and wanting someone to, to kind of come in and deliver firm leadership as chancellor. He wrote a letter to um, the chair of the Catholic Centre Party, who'd written to the president with some misgivings about the Enabling Act. And Hindenburg replied... I wish to assure you that the Chancellor has expressed his willingness, even without formal constitutional obligations, to take measures based on the Enabling Act only after consultations with me. I shall always try to remain in close touch with him and, faithful to my oath, do justice to all men. I'm, I mean, I'm going to assume that's not really true. It's... I think it shows us two things. It shows us that Hindenburg had absolutely no concerns, no worries. He was not somewhat, He was not at this point frightened of what Hitler might do. Yeah. Um, and it also shows that he absolutely trusted implicitly Hitler, even at this early stage. And, and the interesting thing is um, Hitler had famously left a bad impression on Hindenburg when they'd first met. Mm. But in the first few months of 1933, the first few months that Hitler was in office, he, he genuinely won him over. Um, there was fairly close contact between him and his chancellor, um, and he was impressed. He actually came to the opinion that Hitler was doing a good job, that Hitler could be trusted. And so all those ideas that, that Papen and the elite had had about controlling Hitler was kind of thrown out by the fact Hindenburg's own opinion of the Chancellor changed completely. I mean, Papen, had, had, had on, when they'd formed the government, made a deal that he would always have to be present whenever Hitler met Hindenburg. But by April of 33, um, Hindenburg actually told Papen, you don't need to attend the audiences that Hitler has with me. I, I'm fine. Mm. You know, he, he clearly felt at ease with Hitler. He clearly felt he didn't need even his favorite Papen. He didn't need him by his side anymore. So it's just he completely won over. Yeah, no, he absolutely was. And, it, you know, I'll take another example from the same month, April 33. The Nazis passed their civil service laws, which banned Jews um, and other political opponents from holding civil service posts. Um. I think I'm right in saying the first piece of anti-Semitic legislation passed by the Nazi government. And Hindenburg, this was his only other intervention, I would say, um, against the Nazis. He asked that Jewish war veterans or the sons of Jews killed in the First World War be exempt from the law, be still allowed to maintain their posts in the right. civil service, which the Nazis granted. And sometimes that's held up as evidence. Oh, you see, Hindenburg is, is, you know, he's not really agreeing with the Nazis. He's holding them back. He's a restraining influence in the regime. Well, yes and no. Obviously, that meant that um, many thousands of Jews were able to keep their jobs for a while. But on the other hand, um, the fact he took that intervention, I think, is really telling. 
it shows that he didn't oppose the substance of the law itself. He didn't say, no, we shouldn't be banning Jews. Uh, yeah. Post. Just a wholesale. It's just ones that served in the military. Exactly. And by implication, that tells us he didn't oppose the law per se. Yeah. And in fact, in, again, in a private letter explaining the law, um, he actually said that it was fair. The law was fair. Because, and one of the reasons he cited for this was that the Nazis had been victims of injustice from Jewish and Jewish Marxist quarters. Right. So, in his view, he was kind of one of kind of the ways Hindenburg justified it is well, the, Na the Jews have been really mean to the Nazis over the years. The Jews have said horrible things about the Nazis. No wonder the Nazis want to do something bad. Yeah. So this idea that Hindenburg was, you know, this restraining, this restraining force on the Nazis is kind of, I mean, mm. it's 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 simply there isn't evidence for it. There isn't a strong set of examples where you can say, oh well, look, Hindenburg stopped Hitler doing X, Y, and Z. Um, indeed, in fact, as as we've kind of yeah, been saying, it, it, it's, it's kind of the opposite. opposite. Yeah, it's it's actually willing collaboration. And he continued to appear in prominent kind of Nazi propaganda events. The May, May Day celebrations in 33, the Tannenberg commemoration that was held every year in August. Um, and we talked in our Weimar series about his famous broadcasts to the nation, the power that Hindenburg's voice had in his radio broadcasts. He did another one in November 1933, when the Nazis withdrew from the League of Nations and they held a, a plebiscite, a referendum on this decision, basically asking the German people to support them in withdrawing from the League of Nations. And Hindenburg, the night before the vote, went on the radio and said, you know, we should vote in favour of this. He reassured the German people that this was a wise decision, that, that his government was doing it in the best, best interests of peace and equality for Germany. Um, and so, again, lending his very considerable influence to the Nazis and, and doing so, you know, willingly. Um, I find it very difficult to believe that Hindenburg was the sort of man who could be forced to kind of be paraded in this way. Yeah. This is a guy who famously said in 1925 for the election, I won't travel and I won't speak. Um, yeah, you know he's not doing it um, because he's being forced in any way. He's in no way a kind of prisoner. He is, as I've said, a willing collaborator. Now it is true that in 1934, he, the last kind of eight months of his life, he did um, have an ever smaller role in um, in public, at least. And certainly in the summer of that year, his final illness, the last few months. Um, he faded badly and, you know, the kind of image we have of him as, as somehow senile, not really understanding what's going on, just thinking about old wars, that does apply to that those last couple of months of right. his life. So an event like um, the Night of the Long Knives, um, Hitler's bloody suppression of, of political opponents, not least in the SA, um, Hindenburg approves of it, um, sends Hitler a letter of congratulation on it. Uh, but at that point, he's, he's not really compass mentis out. out. So you, you can forgive him maybe that. However, um, his in the first few months of 1934, before his final illness, um, he had had a number of discussions with Hitler about the future. He obviously knew his life was coming to an end. And he therefore wrote um, a kind of political last will and testament, uh, obviously to be revealed on his, his death. Mm -hmm. And it had two parts. It had a public part that would be kind of announced. And it had a private part that was for, for Hitler's eyes only. And the public part was um, very complimentary to Hitler. It was... Um, 
publicly endorsing him as his successor as head of state. It was praising the Nazis for starting Germany back on the road to greatness. So it was kind of a, a, a parting propaganda gift for the Nazis. Yeah. Um, and it showed that in public, Hitler, Hindenburg wanted to express upon his death his, his support for Hitler and his, his kind of will that he was a, his designated successor. Which, again, shows you that Hindenburg didn't have any real concerns. About yeah, Hitler. if he's willing to, to do this. And in a way, more interesting is the, is the private part that was, as I say, for Hitler's eyes only. Because it's here, surely, uh, you know, that Hindenburg would express mis any misgivings, any concerns, you know, because as well, this is to be released on his death. So it can hardly be said that it would be, you know, he'd be afraid of confronting Hitler or anything. Yeah. You know, this was something, advice um, and guidance on his death. So if he'd had concerns, if he'd had worries, if he'd had objections, now would have been the time to raise them in, in private in this will. But actually, this private part of the will reaffirmed that Hitler was his chosen successor and merely discussed, you know, not concerns about dictatorship or, or, or the direction Germany was heading, um, but talked about the question of the restoration of the, of the monarchy, of bringing back the Kaiser, and expressed Hindenburg's kind of feelings in that direction, but crucially left it to Hitler's discretion, basically said you would best be able to judge when and how to bring that about. Yeah. So it definitely didn't demand that Hitler, you know, I'm died, I've died, so now we need to bring back the monarchy. And obviously Hitler had no interest in doing that and never did, but that was the extent to which Hindenburg could have been said to even oppose the Nazis, you know. Yeah, and it's not, and it's not even in an opposition, you yeah. know. So there we are, um, Ludendorff's slippery slope to total um, conspiratorial madness, and Hindenburg's um, willing collaboration with the Nazis. Two interesting and aspects of these two men's careers that maybe we haven't talked about and that I, along with everything else, go into much greater detail and, and tell the story, I hope, effectively, in my new book, Hindenburg, Ludendorff and Hitler. Well, yeah, um, I hope that everyone listening uh, has enjoyed the stories. And if you did, then I do recommend that you pick up Alex's book. It is uh, The link will be down in the description, of course, as always. Yeah, it's been a really fascinating conversation. I, I Ludendorff is always such an interesting figure to me. It's it's just there's something about the about him which is just bizarre. Yes, he is bizarre, and they are a very interesting pair. Yes, um, yes, and and the two of them are very different, but also I think one of the themes going through my book is. They both have an ex a power, incredible amount of power and influence in Germany after the First World War, much beyond probably what they should have done. And they both use that power and influence in different ways to the benefit of Hitler and the Nazi party. So there we are, everyone. Uh, Ludendorff and Hindenburg. Um, so in the next coming uh, weeks, uh, keep an eye on our YouTube channel because we will be uploading some more stuff uh, related to this. Um, also, we'll be uploading some other stuff uh, in the future uh, as podcasts. Um, yeah, keep an eye on, on both the feeds, both those feeds. And uh, as well as that, uh, during the months that we were away, um, we didn't upload. We did pause billing on Patreon. And um, for any months that we don't upload anything, we will continue to to pause yeah. billing on Patreon. If, if we're not putting out podcast episodes. Yeah. Um, so just wanted to make sure that everyone knows that. And yeah. So thank you everyone for, uh, for listening. Uh, I am looking forward to getting more episodes out in 2022. We have some, uh, we have some, we have some stuff planned. We have some interesting stuff planned in terms of podcasts. I think, don't you agree? 
this will do, yeah. We're going to be going a bit further afield, I think, soon. So, thank you everyone for listening. I've been Peter. And I've been Alex. Thanks for listening to History's Most. Thank you.